The Buddha once made a distinction between two types of groups of practitioners, those who are trained in bombast and those who are trained in cross-questioning. The ones trained in bombast are the ones who like to listen to beautiful flowery talks. and just bathe in how nice the words sound. And they're not encouraged to ask, well, what do these words mean? What is the, how is this supposed to be applied? How does this all fit together? As for the group that's trained in cross-questioning, they are encouraged to ask questions. They get very clear about the meanings of things. They're not interested in flowery speeches and nice-sounding words. They want words that actually help, that can be used as tools in the practice. And if not, they're not clear about the words or clear about the concepts, they ask. They're welcome to ask, encouraged to ask. And of course, it's that second group that's identified with the group that the Buddha himself taught the way he taught. And it's pretty obvious he's not referring only to listening to talks. He, you have to learn how to question yourself as well. He wants you to question the ideas you have, question what's going on in your mind. The process is called the same thing, cross-questioning, bhatibhucca. It's also applied to times when you look at your mind and say, okay, where is the stress? Is this constant? Is this inconstant? Is this stressful? Is it not? Is it self? Is it not? What's the cause of this when I have this feeling? Where does it lead? So it encourages people to ask questions about Dharma talks about concepts, about his, how his teachings all fit together, so as to encourage them to look at their own minds and start asking questions there. And there's another process that's also called cross-questioning, which the Buddha gets asked a question, and it's obvious that the person asking the question is really confused, not only about a term, but also how how things fit together, what something can mean. An example is when someone asks the Buddha, why is it that when you teach people some of them gain awakening and some of them don't? So the Buddha cross-questions him and says, give you an example. What do you think of this? Suppose, do you know the path? Excuse me, do you know the road to Rajkir? Yes, I know the road to Rajkir, the guy said. And if someone asks you the way there, and you tell them, what do you tell them? And he says, well, you go to this village, and then you follow the road through that village, and then you get to this park, and then you finally get to Rajkir. He says, now, does everybody who you tell those instructions to actually get to Rajkir? He says, well, no, some people actually follow the instructions and others don't. So the Buddha here is giving him an analogy. He said in the same way, when I pe tell people to follow the practice of virtue, concentration, and discernment, some people follow it and they get the results. Other people don't follow it and they don't get the results. So what the Buddha here is doing is giving the man an analogy. Because someplace in his mind the man was probably thinking, well, if the Buddha is really enlightened, all he has to do is just give the words, give the teaching to people, and bingo, they'll get there. Whereas the Buddha was pointing out a principle of karma. The words themselves were not going to do the work. It was the actual activity of following the instructions, doing the work yourself. That's what's going to take you to awakening.
So this is another kind of cross-questioning, is seeing okay, what analogies are you using in the practice. What ways are you thinking in the practice that get in the way of making progress? So those are things you have to question as well. Because when we think, we tend to think in analogies. You take abstract thought and you usually trace it back and you find it refers to very concrete things, at least the abstractions we deal in tend to have their basis in concrete activities. When we talk about grasping a concept, okay, we're talking about the hand grasping. We're talking about resonating with an idea, okay, that's an analogy to, to music. And if you look carefully, you find that when you come to the practice, you have certain ideas about how the practice should go. I had one student one time who said he had came to the practice with the idea that he'd have to get his breath totally still before he could spread the breath sensations through his body. He had a picture in his mind about how the practice was supposed to go, even though I told him many, many times, as soon as the breath is comfortable, start spreading that sense of comfort. But he had an analogy in his mind to something else, I don't know what. He couldn't even hear what I said. So what all this comes down to is while you're practicing, you find yourself facing difficulties. Stop and think. Ask yourself, okay, how am I thinking about the problem that's actually getting in the way? What if I thought in a different way? And try to think of some skills you have, physical skills like cooking or carpentry. playing a musical instrument, and ask yourself, when you developed that skill, how did you approach it, and what made you more skillful in that skill? And then see if you can apply that lesson to what you're doing in the, in the meditation. Or as the Buddha said, look at the things you're holding on to. This is the whole point of trying to comprehend suffering. Remember, suffering is defined as five clinging aggregates. The Buddha right there is giving you a key. It's the clinging you're going to have to understand. When they talk about comprehending suffering, that's what he means. Comprehend the clinging. See where it is, what it is you're clinging to, and why you want to cling to it, even though it's causing suffering. and see how you can look at it in a way that helps you let go. So this ability to cross-question yourself, to look at things you take for granted and say, well, is it really true? What if I made a different assumption and acted on that? What would that do? This is how you use your ingenuity in the practice. And John Mahabharata tells it one time when he was trying to figure out a statement that John Mudd had made in one of his Dharma talks. He thought about it for three days and finally couldn't come to any conclusion. So he went to ask John Mudd what he meant when he said that. He said, I've been thinking about this for three days and can't come to any conclusion. And John Munn smiled a little bit and said, oh, someone's thinking about what I said? And John Mahaboy said, well, thinking about it, but not with any intelligence. And John, Mah and John Munn said, well, that's okay, we're not all born with intelligence. It's something we have to develop. And of course, he didn't explain what he meant in that statement that John Mahaboy had been thinking about. What this means is that it's, 
Not so much the point of trying to figure out what the speaker was trying to say, but and John Munn was encouraging him to keep on thinking. When you come to a conclusion, test it for yourself, because it doesn't matter whether that was what was intended by the speaker or not. Sometimes words can have unintended, unintended fortunate consequences. He was throwing a John Mahabu back on himself. What answer to that question was most helpful? And that's something you have to learn how to judge for yourself. And the question is, can you trust your conclusions? Well, you test them, test them again, test them again. Because the only real standard we have here is our own honesty. And if you're not sure whether you're honest with yourself, just keep testing it. And after a while you begin to say, oh, this really works, that doesn't work. This gets results. That doesn't get results. I can see that this interpretation helps to redu reduce suffering, reduce stress, and leads to good long-term consequences. Because some things will reduce stress for a little while, but then they lead to long-term pain. You've got to watch out for that, too. That old fallacy that you know, if you have a goal in mind and you haven't reached your goal, you're going to suffer, so you just don't have any goals. That may work for a weekend retreat, but as a long-term policy, it doesn't work at all. Or well, the idea if you put effort into the practice, you're going to suffer, so learn now how not to put any effort. Then you feel better. Well, you feel better, but it's not going to take you anywhere. It's like that old analogy with trying to get milk out of a cow by twisting its horn. You twist and twist and twist, and nothing comes. And then you finally realize that by, when you no longer twist the horn, you feel better, the cow feels better. So you say, okay, I've learned that lesson. Don't put any effort in. Well, that's not the lesson to take. You still don't have any milk. If you want the milk, you realize you've got to twist another part of the cow and pull the other. And that effort gets results. So you're looking not only at being relaxed in the present moment, but learning how to find a way of acting that ultimately leads to a deeper freedom from suffering, a deeper freedom from stress, which may involve some effort right now, but it actually leads to results. So this is why this principle of repeated testing is important. You don't come to quick conclusions and say, well, that must be it, and then say, let's move on to the next lesson. It's good to review what you think you've learned to see if maybe you've got some unskillful or inaccurate ideas mixed up with the accurate ones. Those are the hardest ones. If it, your idea is totally out in left field, it's pretty easy to straighten it out. But if you've got skillful ideas mixed up with unskillful ones, it takes a lot of care to pull out okay, which ones are causing the problems right now and which ones are not. But it's the repeated testing, the repeated questioning. That's what brings clear conclusions and clear results. So this is why the Buddha encouraged this among his students. Anything you don't understand, question. Ask, how is this? What is the meaning of this? And as you learn how to question the words, you can carry that skill over into your practice. If things aren't settling down, well, how is this? Why is this not settling down? What attitudes am I bringing in that are really not helpful? Because that's the kind of cross-question that leads to awakening.
there are many cases throughout the canon where after a cross-questioning like that, is, is the I constant? Is I consciousness constant? Is I contact constant? Are the feelings that arise based on the I, are they constant? You chase these things down, you begin to realize it's not worth hanging on to, not worth claiming to be yourself. You go through the other kinds of sensory input until you've covered the whole thing and what's left when you let go of everything. You've arrived at non-clinging. Non-clinging is how you gain awakening, how you gain freedom. So you can't gain awakening simply by putting the mind through the process of a you know, one method that discourages thought and discourages questioning. It's like putting your mind into a sausage factory. What comes out is sausage, but is it really what you want? The techniques are here for you to use them as a basis for observing what's working, what's not working. They give you a good baseline from which to compare things. If you're working with the breath every day, it's a lot easier to detect changes in the mind. Or if you're working with any particular topic, Consistently, it's easier to see changes in the mind because you've got the breath as a baseline. We've got butto as a baseline, or contemplation of the body as a baseline. That makes it easier to measure the differences in the mind. But you don't stop there. Then you try to figure out, okay, what's wrong when things are not going well, and when things are going right. At the end of a meditation session that's gone really well, sit and think about it for a while. What happened right this time? The breath was the same breath, but somehow the results came out differently. When you learn how to do that kind of questioning and evaluation, that's when the practice leads to insight, and when the insight can be liberating.